What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to HQ. It's big dogs got to eat BDGE fantasy football. Every Friday, we are doing a mock draft. As y'all already know, if you've been following me for a minute, if you are new to the channel, welcome. Make sure you hit that subscribe button if you find the video to be informational, to be valuable. You know what was actually hilarious last week? Like when we couldn't see the sign, the big dogs got to eat sign. I was like, oh, let me uh, go over there and move it so that it's in the picture. And then I moved it so it was literally out of the picture. And someone commented on it. And I was like, fuck. But, but, but we learn from our mistakes as we always do with fantasy football. You know, no matter what you did during the 2018 season, the 2019 season is upon us. So now is the time to start prepping. The best way to prep for your draft is to do mock drafts. If you want to draft with me, every Friday when I do this mock draft on the draft app, um, I invite all of my subscribers who are friends with me on the draft app. So head over to draft.com or head to the app store and just type in draft and you will be able to find the app. Download it. Use promo code BDGE. When you sign up, you will get $3 to draft with on top of whatever deposit you put in there. Add me as a friend. My username is right here at Nick Ercolano. I will add you back. I got almost 500 friends on here now. Y'all are good people. Way more friends than I have in real life. Once I start the draft, I, uh, I create it as I am right now, and it automatically sends out an invite to all my friends. 475 invites sent. Wow. Okay, so it's going to fill up real quick. They have a beautiful app. They have the desktop version of it, of course, and it's filled. Boom. That was a record time, I think. That was like Brandon Cook's 40-yard dash time. Normally, it's around Josh Jacobs' slow-ass 40-yard dash time, but... People are getting quick. People are getting quick in here. So it filled up. We're going to move over to the desktop version of the draft. Let me refresh so this uh, pops up. Where are you, Friday's YouTube film? YouTube movie. We went with movie instead of film today because that's what we'd be putting out on YouTube every day. We are doing five videos a week now that summer started. We've done it for all of June. Wow, we got one month down. Let's go. I'm proud of myself. I don't normally say that, but we worked damn hard during June. We worked damn hard for the last couple months, and that's... Uh, what I put into our draft guide that dropped on Monday. Put all the work that we put in, all the best content is packaged up into the draft guide, bigdogsdraftguide.com, where you can uh, grab it. Who do we got in here? I eat live goats. Uh, I want to say that's Jack Keller because I see the fat Eddie Lacy icon. I got my editor Scott in here at the 111. I see him with that Barry Sanders Abby. Now, this is a 12-team draft. I have the fifth pick. I know a lot of you guys always want to see the 12 teams. I usually do 10 teams because time permitted you know i'm a busy man busy little girl over here at the hq so time, uh, 10 teams usually chop it down a little bit i am the fifth pick in this 12 team draft i guarantee we're gonna see barkley kamara zeke and uh mccaffrey go off the board with the first four picks then i am in a little bit of a predicament at the fifth pick i get a lot of questions who would you take at the fifth pick if you have my rankings which are in my big dogs draft guide obviously you know that melvin gordon is the number five pick for me off the board would i be angry at you if you went with one of the wide receivers d hop Devonte adams no i would not would i be angry at you if you went with david johnson at number five yes i would so relax with that all right we're going with melvin gordon because melvin gordon yes he's got a little bit of the injury history he's missed multiple games in three or four seasons but according to Dr. Morse, he's no more of an injury risk in this season than he ever has been. He's never suffered a significant injury um, throughout his career in the NFL. So it's not like he's got the ACL with Gurley or the Michelle or Sony Michelle who had the torn ACL, which eventually leads to arthritic components in your knee, right? So none of that has happened to Melvin Gordon in the NFL where it's uh, a long-term concern. Yes, he's dealt with a few different injuries, but as far as I'm concerned, Melvin Gordon is an elite fantasy running back when he's on the field. I hope you guys are not hearing this fan in the background. I'm not sure how it's coming in. Let me put it down. It's hot as a mother out here in New Jersey, which is perfect because it's July 4th weekend. So um, I believe y'all are probably watching this on July 5th, which means I'm probably uh, kind of drunk right now. I will be celebrating this weekend. I'm filming this on, on Wednesday, July 3rd. I normally film it the day before. So I normally would film it July 4th, but your, your man's is trying to celebrate Mark's season to the fullest. So I'll be out and about July 4th, July 5th. I want to queue this up a day early. So if any news drops within the next few days, um, any player news or whatever, and it's outdated by a day or two, that is why. Because I film this a day earlier than I typically do. Doesn't mean that the big facts won't be on point because, as you can see, they always are. I went Melvin Gordon at 5. David Johnson at 6. Devontae Adams went at 7. D-Hop, Joe Mixon, Kelsey, Juju at the 11. 
with Joe Mixon, you know, I'm getting a lot of questions about the Jonah Williams injury. Yes, it knocks Joe Mixon down underneath all of the um, elite wide receivers. I had him right behind Melvin. I had him in the same tier as Melvin Gordon, 5'6". Now, he's still the same ranking for me. I believe he's still RB6 in my in my rankings in the draft guide, but he's moved down a tier, which tells you that I would rather have Kelsey, Juju, Michael Thomas, Julio Jones, all these elite wide receivers who are a lot safer than Joe Mixon. And we're actually hearing, uh, I think something just came out on Roto World today, and this is something I've been talking about for a while, that like Gio is a fantastic best ball draft pick, right? And I, I own a pretty decent amount of Geo, I believe. We'll check my ownership uh, percentage later because we'd actually do that on draft.com. I just learned this week. Uh, the Athletics' Paul Denner predicts Gio Bernard will see 11 to 13 touches per game in 2019. I think there will be more of Joe Mixon and Joe, Gio Bernard out there together than you have seen in recent years. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised because we do have a new offense coming in. And it's going to be a little bit different, probably a more high pace. 11 to 13 touches is fucking definitely way too optimistic. I'd say realistically between six and eight touches, maybe on a good day, he'll hit those double digit touches. But that's definitely a little bit scary if you're a Joe Mixon owner, because that means that maybe he won't take over that full workhorse role. He did towards the end of last year, but again, that was a different coaching staff. Um, But Mixon has all the tool sets to be that workhorse. I I think, I mean, we saw Gio Bernard fill in from last year, had multiple RB1 weeks when Joe Mixon was out with the knee. And they're drafting. Everyone keeps saying, oh, Trayvon Williams and and Rodney Anderson. Guys, I I can't say this like enough times. I've said it so many damn times um, that those rookies are not going to have an impact this year. Six rounders, all, you know, potential. I wouldn't be surprised if one of them got cut. I mean, look at, I'll explain in a second. Uh, I'm going to go with Mike Evans here. If you look at their lineup, right, M- Mark Walton got released. So literally they only had Joe Mixon and Geo. So them drafting guys in the sixth round should not be a surprise. They didn't draft those guys to come and compete with these other guys. Geo has been a very, very, very solid back for the Cincinnati Bengals over the last few years. Um, and I didn't need to see that report to, you know, have faith in him as a good best ball pick. Um, the report doesn't scare me when it comes to Joe Mixon. The uh, the injury to Jonah Williams, who had been a three-year starter at Alabama, um, had shown production on the college field, and was the top prospect this year, basically, at the position. So that does scare me, because now they're back to having not a good offensive line. Cordy Glenn is going to be moving back to left tackle. He was one of the worst graded left tackles in the NFL last year. So we had uh, second round. It was Julio Jones, Nick Chubb, James Conner, Dalvin Cook, Odell, Le'Veon Bell, D'Angelo Williams, Mike Evans. I went with Mike Evans. Now, did you, uh, what I like about drafting early on if you do get a top five pick and you end up with one of those top five running backs or you know a lot of you guys will say David Johnson at the back end of the first half I like the fact that you can grab someone like Mike Evans I've had a lot of drafts where I started off one of the top five running backs and then Mike Evans and I absolutely love Mike Evans this year he has quietly coming off one of his best career season it probably was his best career season overall um, in 2018 and now we have Deshaun Jackson leaving and Adam Humphreys leaving, which will open up a lot of targets in that offense. And you think about how much volume Mike Evans got prior to Deshaun Jackson coming over and how much of a deep threat he really is. And people really seem to play that down, I feel like. Um, so I think Mike Evans is going to be among the league leaders in, in terms of targets this year. And I think at the back half of the second round, man, that is fantastic for your wide receiver one. He might be a little bit inconsistent, maybe scoring touchdowns or like week to week, he might have a couple bust games, but... Um, I think overall the volume will make sure that his floor is a little bit higher than people realize. Ah, I just got sniped on. I, I, this is the part about where I'm drafting that I absolutely hate. Cooper was probably the last guy in this tier that I like. Like I want no part of Todd Gurley in the third round. Although I own literally no, no shares of Todd Gurley. So I might take him in the third round here. Because that's how I operate. When I'm in a lot of leagues, see, I don't, I don't think there's any value anywhere else. All the tight ends are off the board. I'm going to do something very nonchalant, very uh, off-brand of me and take Todd Gurley at the 3-5. I'm sure there will be plenty of comments down below. I don't. I, I honestly think this might be the first time I've drafted Todd Gurley um, since, like, February in a draft. Because you have to get him in the third, second, third round. When I'm doing draft, I always diversify. No matter how much I love a player. And this is a very cool part of draft. So if you are on the desktop, you can sign on to draft and click on upcoming up here. Then you can click on NFL 2019 best ball and then best ball ownership. 
and then you could filter it down to any sizes that you want. So normally we'll just go off the 12 person contests and it will tell you the ownership of players, right? How much ownership do you have in certain players? So you guys know I love Carson Wentz. He is my most owned quarterback, but it's only at 29%, which is still a lot, right? If I'm doing, I think I'm at 104 drafts right now. Yes, I have a lot of drafts. I'm telling you, when you guys join and you add me as a friend, I open up like eight drafts a week. So you will probably end up getting in a draft with me. If you throw $10 into your account, plus use promo code BDGE when you sign up, you'll get an extra $3 on top of that. Boom, that's 12, 13 drafts that you can do from now until the start of your season and you will be fully prepped to uh, to draft. Man, Scott just snipes literally every player I talk about. It's actually hella disrespectful. Um, so you can look at ownership ownership uh, of, of certain players and positions and whatnot. And uh, Carson Wentz is my most owned quarterback by far. I think he's in for a top five year fantasy. Nothing says otherwise. And then these are some of my later uh, late round guys that I like, as well as some of the guys I own in the early of the drafts. Now, Miles Sanders is a guy that I've talked about in the last few episodes. Um, yesterday or two days ago, I put out a video of my top rookie running backs. Um, my top rookie running backs... And I talked about Miles Sanders, how he was dropping, and I got a ton of shares prior to knowing that he was uh, his he was dealing with a hamstring injury. Now I haven't really been taking him that much because the, one of the best values is drafting right after the or right before the NFL draft and drafting all of these like top running backs. Right, if you know and have an idea for who the top three, four running backs are going to go in the NFL draft, you could usually get them in like double digit rounds. So I believe I was getting Miles Sanders in like the thirteenth round before the NFL draft happened. Um, that's why my owner percentage is so high. I love Karen Johnson. You guys know I love Matt Breida. Love Peyton Barber too. And as you could see, like I put my money where my mouth is, right? I've been saying all offseason that I think Peyton Barber is going to have a big impact in this in this offense. And I think that he's going to be... Um, I think that he is going to make more of a splash than people realize. And I think he was way more efficient last year than a lot of people realize. That team overall just didn't have a lot of rushing goal line opportunities. So, like, there wasn't anything for him to have there, you know? Like, that's why he didn't score a lot of touchdowns. Um, in terms of yards created and, like, elusiveness, Peyton Barber was, like, top 10 in the NFL among running backs, guys, when you look at the advanced metrics. So, we're at the 4-8 right now. Ugh, see, this is... I actually hate the fifth overall pick because there's just no value on the board here anymore. Like, all of these wide receivers are pretty much in the same tier all of these running backs, Kenyon Drake is just shooting up drafts. I'm actually going to grab OJ Howard, which is something I don't normally do. I don't go with the tight end there when I could probably get Hunter Henry around later or so. But as you'll see in my draft guide, which again is on is live right now, I want to look at some of the market share data for Peyton Barber. This is going to load really slow because I am recording this and the OBS software uh, takes up a lot of RAM, a lot of gigs whatever you want to call it, and it makes everything else run slow. But again, if anything happens on your draft.com, like it runs a little bit slowly, use a draft app. The app on the mobile site is incredible. Um, super, super, super duper clean, fast. Never have glitch or problems with that. Uh, so we had Kenyon Drake, then Terry Kill. Yeah, Kenyon Drake is just is starting to go earlier and earlier and earlier. And y'all like... This is still a miserable offense. This is still a miserable offensive line. Like, you guys are going to hype him into where he was getting drafted exactly last year. Right? And I, I don't know. There's just, like, there's so much risk picking running backs in really bad offenses. There's so much risk. Tyreek Hill, he keeps shooting. <laughs> it's so funny. Like, it's one fucking little Roto World blurb comes out, and Tyreek's Hill, Tyreek Hill's ADP just fucking roller coasters. Right? They, some guy in the Chiefs organization apparently said that He's only getting a maximum four-game suspension. Like, that's not even a source. That's just literally someone saying something. So now everyone's picking him in the fourth round. When a suspension comes back out that it's eight or ten games, which I still think is probably going to be the case. I could be totally wrong and look like an asshole saying this. Um, then his ADP is going to shoot back down into the tenth round or the fucking twelfth round or something. So what I normally do is... See, that's why I hate that first spot, like where I just took O.J. Howard... Because all of the guys that I was thinking about, whether it's Calvin Ridley or Tyler Lockett or Sammy Watkins, they all still end up falling because it's just a giant tier. Uh, I'm going to grab Tyler Lockett. I actually really, really, really like Tyler Lockett here because everyone just uses the lazy analysis. Oh, the touchdown regression has to come. Blah, 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 blah. But Tyler Lockett's also stupidly efficient. Um, and he's had a career 10% touchdown catch rate. So 10% of his 
catches have gone for touchdowns in his career. Russell Wilson, 10% of his throws uh, or 10% of his completions have gone for touchdowns. So, like, the regression is going to come. But if Tyler Lockett, who projects to run the slot now that Doug Baldwin is gone, he is easily the, he's the only proven wide receiver on that team. Tyler Lockett, I know people are like, he's not a volume guy. He got, eight, uh, he got what do you have? He only had 77 targets this year. He's going to easily clip over 100 targets this year. He'll probably catch 75 to 80 balls. And if you just use his normal touchdown career rate, you know, 10% of his catches go for touchdowns, he's still going to be looking at seven to eight touchdowns. And a guy who has boom bust ability, right? A guy who's going to score seven, eight touchdowns, but also make tons of big plays. That's a guy I want in my lineup. So I actually kind of like Tyler Lockett in the fifth round, although people think of him as such a boomer bust guy. Let's look at Peyton Barber. And actually, he's right here on the list. So this is one of the uh, one of the tools that we have in the Big Dogs Draft Guide. It's the market share sheet. So we have it for regular receiving, rushing, red zone receiving, red zone rushing. And Peyton Barber's like ninth on the list right here. 37 red zone carries. Red zone carry market share. This is what I want to see. So although the volume, you know, wasn't great, he had five red zone rushing touchdowns last year, which is actually way more than I thought. He had 59% of the red zone carries last year in his respective offense, which was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eighth highest rate in the NFL. Make sure I'm not missing my pick. Eighth highest rate in the NFL. Um, 10 zone carry market share. Peyton Barber, it looks like he was around 8th or ninth again, 64%. Um, so he was very involved down there. They just didn't have a lot. And he had 75% of the goal line rushes. Guys, like his size compared to Ronald Jones' size is like comparing me to Snacks. I would eat his ass alive. Peyton Barber is 220, 225. Ronald Jones is like barely 200 pounds. On the goal line, if, if you're buying into the fact that Tampa Bay is going to be more efficient, have more scoring opportunities then Peyton Barber, then you should be looking at Peyton Barber as a guy that's probably going to score. If he scored five rushing touchdowns last year with like no luck going his way, he should easily be scoring eight, nine, even I would not be surprised whatsoever if Peyton Barber ended up scoring 10 rushing touchdowns this year. So again, I put my money where my mouth is. He is my fourth highest owned running back because you're able to get him in like the 14th round. Now it probably won't go in the 14th round of this best ball draft just because might have did a little bit of a write-up on him in my draft guide, and maybe people will start picking him a little bit earlier. But um, Peyton Barber is one of the absolute best best ball targets. And we just had the report come out about um, about Peyton Barber that said that he is a he has a very good chance. Let me see if I can find it quickly for you guys. Sorry for just jumping all over the place. This is just how my mock drafts operate. All right, so we're in the late sixth round also. We had... Uh, Christian Kirk, but literally Scott just takes all the players I like. He j only just drafts all the players I like. All my must draft players. It's fantastic. Sixth round at the early beginning of sixth round is probably way too early for Kirk, considering he usually goes in the seventh, eighth round. So you could definitely wait on him there. Although I, uh, you know, I think he'll have that kind of value during the year. When we're in the sixth round, I made this point last week. It's a one quarterback league, right? In these best ball leagues. In these best ball leagues, it, it starts one quarterback. You can see the starting lineup here. One quarterback, two running backs, three wide receivers, one tight end. But it's best ball. So for those of you guys that are new to best ball, you don't make sit start decisions. You don't make waiver wire decisions. You don't, you don't use a waiver wire at all. You don't make trades. You make nothing, no decisions except for uh, the draft. The software automatically takes all your roster, your players and starts the best players that week at that position takes the point totals of the three wide receivers two running backs etc and that's your point total for that week and it goes for the entire season and then whoever whichever team has the most points at the end of the year is the one who uh, wins money or the top three teams win money so when you're drafting in a season-long league the reason you could wait on quarterback is because it's replaceable if you draft Lamar Jackson or Josh Allen and their rushing totals aren't what you thought they would be and they suck passing you could drop them and pick someone else off the waiver wire you can't do that in best ball leagues, right? So having an elite quarterback, while you might think waiting on them is a great strategy, you know, you don't have the opportunity to drop players and add new players. You draft a big team, 18 players on the roster. So you have a little bit of leeway to work around and, you know, move up and down your bench spots and, and strategize that way. But I really suggest that when you guys are doing best ball leagues, 
when these elite quarterbacks, you know, that top tier, Mahomes, Luck, Rodgers, Watson, when they start falling into the sixth, seventh round, grab one of those guys there because they will be a difference maker having those elite number of fantasy points in your lineup every week as opposed to shooting for high upside guys whose risk is absolutely there. But when you're in a season long, you have the opportunity to, you know, uh, move them up and down or move them off your roster. All right, so we're getting into the seventh round. I already have my, ooh, I got sniped on Miles Sanders, man. I eat live goats. Is that you, Jack? I feel like that's you. Where did your Avi go? It was Fat Eddie Lacy like fucking 10 minutes ago. He keeps sniping me. So uh, Miles Sanders, I absolutely love as a seventh round pick. He keeps falling. He started moving up to like the fifth round and I didn't really love him there. But now that we're here in the seventh round, kind of a big fan of Will Fuller. And again, like I'm not touching Ronald Jones in the seventh, eighth round when you can get Peyton Barber eight rounds later. Uh, Where are you? Okay, Peyton Barber. The Athletics' Greg Allman said Peyton Barber is certainly likely to finish with more yards than Ronald Jones. If he's going to finish with more yards than Ronald Jones, there is no doubt he's going to finish with more touchdowns than Ronald Jones too. So by that logic, who's going to be the better fantasy football player? And who's the better value in drafts? Even if you think Ronald Jones, that's not true. Ronald Jones will lead him in yards. Peyton Barber is going to be the better value in these drafts, man. So um, grab grab Peyton Barber wherever his ass is going. How far down the list is he? Look how far down he is. 126 overall. So you can get him in like the 11th, 10th, uh, 11th, not 12th round. Grab Will Fuller. He's a great best ball option because, again, you don't have to choose when to start him. Even though he's not really a boomer bust guy. He just always plays well with Deshaun Watson there. And, uh, of course, the injury risk is is what keeps you away from him. Sorry, I got a, I made food right before this video like an idiot. And I'm hungry. Big dog got to eat. Hey, hey. I just got back from the gym. Made some eggs. Eggs, some lean ground beef, onions, threw some guac on that. Mmm, this shit is delicious. You know we're cutting out carbs. Summer 19, baby. Sorry, I know like uh, eating on camera is not very forthcoming of me. I know people are going to get big mad about that. Actually, last time when I started off, I think it was a running back fantasy video, my running back rankings video, I started off, it was National Donut Day, so naturally I started off by eating like four donuts, and then there was a, a massive amount of comments talking about doing a mukbang. I have no idea what the fuck that was, and I looked it up, and it's literally just like people eating weird and an insane amount of food just in front of the camera. I don't even think they talked to the camera. I didn't watch any, but I assume that's what it was. But I'm not not ever going to do that. If you want to watch me eat a ridiculous amount of food, I I made a video with my best friend Steve like last year doing a 10,000 calorie challenge. See, I'm slowing down right now. I need to do that intentionally because when I do these best ball, these mock drafts, I, uh, I talk really fucking fast and then I lose my train of thought all the time and I need to intentionally keep thinking about doing that. To slow down, capture my thoughts, capture my breath. I want everyone watching right now to take a deep breath. One one other thing that really helps alleviate uh, alleviate your anxiety. Am I saying that right? is when you wake up first thing in the morning, don't look at your phone. Wait as long as you possibly can before you look at your phone, especially you young people, like you millennials that immediately pick up your phone and go on Instagram. Don't look at it for as long as you can and you will have a, you will feel so much better throughout the day, especially during that hour and then like the next hour after that, you will feel like a weight off your chest. I don't know why it's weird, but when you go on all those social platforms and you immediately wake up and connect to the world, you start getting this overarching sense of anxiety. Um, and maybe it's like judging yourself compared to these other people or whatnot, but it's there, right? It's like this underlying cloud that kind of hangs over you. If you don't do it, you know, get up. Always, always other pro tip, always hydrate before you caffeinate. Chug a bottle of water, chug a glass of water, hydrate before we caffeinate. I have to make my pick though. I already took a tight end, so we're not looking at tight end. I took a good quarterback. Um, we're looking at running backs. We're looking at wide receivers. I already have three and two. So I like in this, in this, the eighth round is probably a little early for this, although everyone's kind of starting to go early. 
Um, I like the idea of these Green Bay Packers wide receivers, man. I really, really do. I think in most of my season-long drafts and most of my best ball drafts from here on out, I will be um, I will be targeting Marquez Valdez-Scantling for the most part. And then depending, I think what's going to happen is we're going to keep, we keep hearing buzz. There's so much buzz from Packers camp about these two wide receivers. I want the outside wide receiver in Green Bay, whoever that is. There's so much more potential there, in my opinion. Um, and I think all, most of the reports have Marquez Valdez-Scantling as the one who is running as the wide receiver two outside in two wide receiver sets. So he's probably the guy that I would rather own right now because Aaron Rodgers is one of the few elite quarterbacks in the league that... He's so accurate outside the numbers, outside the hashes, and that's what makes him so dangerous. There are very few quarterbacks that trust their arm and are accurate outside the numbers, and those wide receivers end up eating, right? When you are an accurate quarterback like an Aaron Rodgers, I'm sure Baker Mayfield will be this guy in a couple years. Um, those guys eat on the outside. So he doesn't he doesn't depend. I think that's a reason why you see him not really throw the tight end as much because he prefers throwing it to the outside. And most quarterbacks, you know, lean on throwing to their running backs, lean on throwing short slant routes over the middle to their tight end or to their slot guy. So when I'm looking at wide receivers in Green Bay, I always want the outside guy. And that looks like it's going to be MBS. And it makes sense that Geronimo Allison is the one shifting into the slot because he, at the end of the day, is a much lesser athlete than Marquez. And I'll get back into that in a second. Slow down, Nicholas. Slow down. So I will probably be targeting both. If I can get them in like the ninth, 10th round, both of them, I would be fine with that because one of them is going to blow up and have a monster season in Green Bay. Um, I like Deshaun Jackson a lot here too. Uh, absolutely love him in best ball because, again, you don't have to choose when to start him. And uh, since we started off with running backs in two of the first three rounds, although one of them was fucking girly, so I'd probably need to start drafting i might go heavier depth on the running back later in the draft um Gurley's a guy i i, I almost already know exactly who are going to be my sell high and buy low candidates like a lot of the guys you'll hear me shit on throughout my videos the running back videos i already know what's going to happen and this is you know occupational hazard this is what happens when you I have people watching your videos, right? They love to come back and comment on them the year after. A lot of the guys that I don't like, right? Josh Jacobs, Todd Gurley, these guys going within the first three rounds. It's not going to surprise me whatsoever when Gurley starts hot off the gate, right? 18 touches, 22 touches, 17 touches, four touchdowns over the first three games, and then he falls off. Josh Jacobs thrust into a, uh, a workhorse role, right? 23 touches the first game. Averaging 3.8 yards per carry, you, you sub-go that yards per carry, you sub-go the inefficiency because you love the volume. This is what's going to happen. All these running backs are going to get a shitload of touches over the first two, three, month of the season, even month and a half of the season, right? But that doesn't, that's not your entire fantasy season, guys. It is a 16-week season, assuming you were about to take home the chip, and that's what we're going to do here at Big Dogs. We're going to make sure you take home the chip. 16-game season, the first four to six weeks are important, but they are not everything. A lot of these guys will start hot off the gate, and then I will go back and get tons of comments and tons of tweets about how I was wrong, and about how I'm a fucking asshole, and how I don't know what I'm talking about, and then these guys will fall off, and these are the sell-high targets. So, a lot of you guys, maybe you don't want to fade them in the draft. Maybe I won't even fade some of these guys in my draft. I will film all of the season-long drafts that I do so you guys can see what my teams end up being. Maybe I won't fade them, but I already know the majority of guys that I tell you not to draft or I tell you to fade at their current ADP are going to be on my sell high lists because I already know that most of them are going to start hot off the gate. But I think they will falter. They will succumb to injuries. They will prove to be inefficient and eventually work themselves into a running back by committee. So that is my point. That is a strong point, I should say, to get across to you guys to understand that when I am fading a lot of these guys, I think they will, they're not, they're not going to fucking go for zero yards every single game, right? They're going to have big games, but I think the majority of them will come in the beginning of the season and then they will fade away. What was I talking about? Uh, okay. Yeah. So when we look at these, the, the athletic profiles of these wide receivers in Green Bay, um, the, the common sense thing to take away is like Jerron Allison, long, right? And was productive for Green Bay last year, but from an athletic standpoint, slow in the 40, 21st percentile weight adjusted speed score, does not have good burst, does not have good agility. And think about what moving him to the slot does for 
uh, an older athlete like uh, an older athlete like Larry Fitzgerald, right? We see a lot of these guys who have trouble separating, and that would make sense if Geronimo Allison is a guy who is not fast enough, right? His long speed is not good enough most of the time to separate from cornerbacks. Move him into the slot where you don't necessarily have to create separation. You know what I mean? So like Larry Fitzgerald, again, right? When he got old and Arians moved him into the slot, he crushed it. So moving a guy who's not athletically gifted into the slot is an easy way to help him gain separation just from a common sense standpoint. And then when you look at Marquez Valdez-Scantling, he is much faster. Sub 4'4", 40 yard dash speed while being 6'4 and 206 pounds. 97th percentile weight adjusted speed score. So he's someone that can naturally um, separate on the outside by himself. So it makes sense that he would beat out Geronimo on the outside and then moving Geronimo on the inside helps him from an athletic standpoint. And I want the I want the wide receiver too that's, that's on the outside with Aaron Rodgers. And I know Randall Cobb ate um, during his time as a slot receiver when he was in Green Bay. And that's certainly an argument for Allison, which is why I'm not saying fade Allison. I like both these guys, and I'll look for both of these guys. But Randall Cobb, again, 4-4-6 speed compared to, and he's like more of a tip, prototypical slot guy, right? That was what he was made to do. He was in his prime while he was running the slot for Green Bay, right? He was like 23 years old, 24 years old, having those seasons. Okay, things are getting a little bit messy here. Um, I would still try to get a second quality quarterback within like the first 12 rounds I really like Dak Prescott here I own a ton of him um if we go back to the ownership percentages let me see if I own a ton of him actually I could just be lying to you guys okay maybe I don't own a ton of, I feel like I've drafted Dak so many times this can't be right oh you know what we're looking at 12 teams and almost like 90 percent of the mock drafts I do with you guys are 10 teams all right well Dak's up there a little bit 11 percent he's tied for fifth highest ownership percentage um, regardless, so look, you'll see the ownership percentage, Aaron Rodgers, Andrew Luck, Deshaun Watson. Um, when it goes to 12 teams, all of the drafts that I do outside of the mock drafts, the mock drafts are usually 10 teams. The ones I do on Friday and put out these videos, because again, it's more time, less time consuming. The ones I do throughout the week where I'll invite you guys again, if you add me draft.com, add Nick Ercolano, use promo code BDGE, add me. Those are usually 12 teamers. So I'll invite more people into it. So you have a better chance of getting in. Um, forget what I was even saying, to be honest. What the fuck was I talking about? Yeah, well, anyways, Randall Cobb, much better athlete, was in his prime. Um, so it makes sense that he dominated in the slot. And uh, I think that Marquez is, is the guy to target here. Coming into his second year, uh, breakout candidate, you know, big time breakout candidate. And uh, when we start getting into these rounds, I think like a lot, okay, so here's something. A lot of people are drafting guys like, the, you know, another another point with Terry Kill. In my opinion, right now, at this point in, in the offseason, there is no reason to draft guys who are, one, suspended, two, uh, dealing with injuries, like serious injuries. Like Jarek McKinnon in the 10th round. I'm sorry, BDC baller. I think that's a monumental mistake when you can get Matt Breida five rounds later. A pick 160. Um, guys who might not even... It, here's the number one tip. I got a lot of people sending me screenshots of their team, like rate my team. Do not pick guys that are on the roster bubble. Guys that might not even make their team, that is a, a massive hit to your lineup. When you're drafting guys in best ball, draft guys that you know at least are going to make an impact in the season. Not guys you think are going to make an impact. Like, um, let me see, like down here. We get a lot, like I get a lot of like Marquise Goodwin. I will not touch Josh Gordon because he's just as good of a chance of not even being on the team at all to being on the team. Um... Like a lot of these guys down here might not even make their teams. Demarcus Robinson, there's yeah, look at their range of outcomes. If their range of outcomes within like a decent percentage chance is that they don't even see the field this year, don't waste a pick on them, please. Because even players that might put up six points a game or something, ooh, do I want Peyton Barber or do I want Devin Funches here? Or Edo Smith. I like all these guys here. And Deion Lewis, man. Shit. Um I'm gonna go with the running back because we only have two on the roster right now, and Gurley was one of them. Don't think he's going to stay healthy for the whole year. So when you're drafting guys that might make a zero impact, having guys behind them, like if you draft a guy who ends up getting cut, right? And then one of your other guys behind him is strictly an upside play, right? You draft like Raquel Armstead or you draft Alexander Madison, who are really only getting on the field if they, since they are a handcuff, they're only getting on the field if the starting guy gets injured. You might now have two running back slots that get you zero points per week. Wouldn't you rather have a guy like Peyton Barber 
who might only get you 60 total yards from scrimmage, but will score a touchdown every other game, every third game. So in those games where, you know, you have to start two running backs and Peyton Barber is your second highest scoring guy with like eight points, that's much better than having a zero in your lineup. Because again, you deal with bye weeks, you deal with injuries, you deal with guys getting cut. So at this point in the season, you have a good idea of guys that are... Um, guys that are on the roster bubble. And if they're on the roster bubble or if, you know, if they're suspended or if, if they haven't even hit the field yet, like that's my thing with Jarek McKinnon. He has not even got back to the field yet and he's still recovering from his ACL. There's no reason. I think he might end up on the pup list. Anyone who's going to, who might end up on the pup list needs to be severely shot down your rankings. And if they're already a double digit pick, then they probably need to be off your board. So I say that because Cooper Cup might end up on the pup list. And uh, he's not someone that I'm not going to draft, but I'm not drafting him anywhere near his ADP. Um, what else do we got? Also, if y'all are enjoying the video, I would very much appreciate if you just scroll down a little bit and hit that thumbs up button. I'd actually love you for that. I, I can't believe I took Todd Gurley in the third. What an asshole. But the, the whole reason I did that, the reason behind that is because, you know, you get an idea of who your most owned players are. And when you look at, like, players who you have none, like, you don't own any of, um, you know, it, it, you might want to diversify. Here you go. So I own four, I have a 4% ownership share in Todd Gurley. I own him in two drafts, two out of, hmm. So there's 104 contests, but it doesn't break up how many were 12, how many were 10, etc. So I'm not sure, two out of whatever. So, you know, sometimes it's good to look at here and be like, oh, I'm fading, especially like the top guys, right? Like if you look at your ownership percentage and you look down and you're like, uh, who's someone that's like getting drafted very highly? Like Amari Cooper. I own one share of Amari Cooper, one share of Antonio Brown. That's got to be different because I feel like I own a decent amount of them in 10-person leagues. Okay, I own a couple more shares of Brown there, and where's Amari? Yeah, three more shares of Amari Cooper there. Um, when you start looking at the top guys, that's when I think you need to look at the ownership percentage because, I mean, the bottom tier guys, it's really whatever, but the top tier guys, if you just keep fading the same players, again, I, I say this every video, but there's a good chance that you're going to be wrong on a lot of guys. So if you're wrong on a guy that's going in the first two, three rounds, that means that they're probably ending up as a top 12 guy at their position and you don't want to completely fade that you know what I mean so if you realize that you've only drafted like one fucking guy or something uh you've only let you only drafted one guy who's going the second round like one time you probably want to start diversifying the ownership a little bit in case you're wrong oh so I might still end up being able to get Devin Funches and or Ido Smith which is solid uh I'm a fan of Devin Funches man I think he's gonna be a perfect best ball guy He's so young, too, and, like, he got such a bad rep because, I mean, one, he was getting thrown to by Cam Newton, but he still has plenty of career left to go, and, like, what better place could he have gone to than in uh, Indianapolis? So I'm going to grab Devin Funches here, and I'm going to pray that Edo Smith falls to me. So now we have, oh, we already have six wide receivers on the roster. I'll usually end up with seven or eight wide receivers on the roster I'll probably go with seven and then go with six running backs because I don't really like the strength of my running backs right now. Um, when the fuck did I take a second quarterback? Oh, I took Dak. That's right. Totally forgot taking that. Yeah, so again, that, that's one of the big takeaways from this is that it's not like it is a one quarterback league, but it's not a one quarterback in the sense that you can use the whole like waiver wire streaming theory because streaming is not a thing in this. Which is also why I want a top tier tight end. And uh, OJ Howard, I went with in the fourth round, and I, I might end up doing that in season long leagues. Maybe I could, I probably could have waited till the fifth round to grab OJ Howard. Um, depending on, I actually want to see where his ADP is. I'm going to check that right quick. And when you're in the uh, draft app, you can, oh yeah, also, if you're going to add me in the draft app, you actually have to do it on the app. You can't do it on desktop, I don't believe. Uh, so you would go, you would be on the homepage or whatever, and you would go to the bottom menu thing that says profile. And then you'll see like followers and following. And there's a, uh, a plus, there's a little head in the top right where you can just hit that. 
and it lets you follow friends. And then you just type my name in Nick Erko. All right, so we are we already have enough running backs. Okay, cool. So we have Edo Smith is here. I'm going to grab Edo Smith because he's probably my favorite guy here. I actually like Devin Singletary a lot too. But again, I think Edo Smith is going to have a very safe workload um, floor week to week. I love Matt Breida here. I, I, we haven't heard anything from Matt Breida in terms of his chest, which makes me a little nervous. I saw this report, believes one of Tevin Coleman, Jarek McKinnon, or Matt, Matt Breida will be a healthy scratch in regular season. Yeah, I think it's going to be Jarek McKinnon, and it's not going to be a healthy scratch. I think it's going to be an unhealthy scratch. Um, so, yeah, back to O.J. Howard. One of the articles I write in my season-long draft guide is must draft players round by round. And what I do is look at the ADPs of players in each round, and I take one guy that you have to draft. Actually, don't know how to do this because you guys are going to... I don't want you to see all the content in my draft guide unless you bought that shiz. And I look at the ADPs, and I select one guy in each draft, but it has to be at the back end of the draft. Like, I'm not going to tell you you have to draft Saquon Barkley because the only way you're getting him is if you have a top three pick, probably number one pick. Um, so I take one guy in the back half of each round because for the most part, those guys are probably available to you at most picks. So if you're drafting like the 10th, 11th, or 12th, maybe they're not available, but they're going to be available to you at the beginning of the previous round. Um, so... I take one guy, back half of each round, and it's one guy that I think should be targeted in that round. No questions asked. Almost like a must-target, a must-own guy in that round. And one of the picks was O.J. Howard as a tight end. I believe his ADP is actually in the fifth round. So, um, let me actually pull. I think I could probably pull him up, pull up his player profile. Oh, they don't let you do it from here. You have to do it on the app. Or I have to go back to his circle up here and take him. Let me go to one of my drafts and see where he's at. Skirt. I apologize for the pauses. Sorry, guys. It's not that easy to talk about fantasy for one hour straight. With nothing else touching your mind. That didn't even make fucking sense. They also uh, started up the Best Ball Championship, which is a three and a half million dollar guaranteed prize pool, which is fucking dope. The winner takes a million dollars. It's a $25 buy-in. Almost 25,000 entries already, which is cool. All right, cool. Devin Singletary fell to me here. There are a lot of guys down here that I absolutely love. As you see, as you saw my, my ownership uh, percentage, I own a lot of... Um, I well, can go to all sizes, but that's kind of skewed because like three and 16 drafts are stupid. Even though I end up doing them a lot. You'll see like Jalen Richard, some of my favorite late round guys, Matt Breida, Peyton Barber, Malcolm Brown. Like I feel like Malcolm Brown is an auto smash in like the 14th round. Uh, Malcolm Brown, Chase Edmonds, Marlon Mack, oh, Marlon Mack's not a fucking late round guy. Jalen Richard, told y'all, Deion Lewis, they're all, they all have such good receiving floors. That you want that on your team, I'm telling you. Um, what the fuck was I even talking about? I had something. Oh, I kept looking for his ADP, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, OJ Howard's ADP is 51.6 on draft, which would be a fifth round pick. I think that's a great target in the fifth round. I talked to Dr. Jesse Morris about it. And I'm going to try to just fly by here. No, I'm not going to even fucking put that to chance. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put it all the way down here so you guys can't see it. Hey, wow, that's well done by me. What a beast. Skirt. What an asshole I am by, for doing this. So for... O.J. Howard, right? I, I, you know, I, I DMs Dr. Jesse Morse, and I'm asking him, you know, how how afraid should I be of one? I need to fucking make a pick, 
We're going to go with uh, Jalen Richard again, as I always do in the 15th round. Um, how afraid should I be of O.J. Howard? Quite the opposite. I'm probably going to be targeting him as one of my later tight ends after the top three, four. Talent is there. It could be a beast. Yeah, obviously. But he finished both years on the IR. If they happen earlier in the season, I call him injury prone. He likely wears down by week 10 or 11 and is prone to rolling high ankle sprains. So this is another thing, taking injuries into context, right? He thinks that maybe he's not in the best shape or not the best conditioning. I don't know what OJ Howard's ankles look like, but from the top of his body, I'd imagine he's pretty muscular down low as well. Maybe it's not the case. Maybe he's all stacked on the top and that's why he keeps getting injured. Um, so he thinks that OJ Howard is not as big of an injury risk, but if we think that, you know, he, he slows down or his conditioning is bad by the end of the year, that's another sell high candidate. If OJ Howard is a beast for you through the first 10 weeks of the season, maybe you ship him off. Cause we've now seen two years in a row where it's lower leg injuries. I, I believe they were both to the same, uh, to the same foot or the same leg. Um, so that might be just a common cause. And we have sports injury predictor predicts him to miss one and a half games. If you're getting OJ Howard for 14 and a half games, I'm pretty sure you're going to be pretty happy with how the outcome comes out. The guy's a beast. We already know that. So OJ Howard is a guy that I'm going to continually target at the tight end position because those top three tight ends keep going in the second round. And unless it's Kelsey in the early second round, I will not be taking Kittle or Ertz in the second round. Um, Kittle, I love Kittle, and I think he's a beast. I think he's super young. He just broke out in his second year. But he doesn't give you a positional advantage to the point where he's a second-round pick. I just don't see it happening. Um, and Ertz, he's, Ertz is going to be dealing. There's a lot of weapons in this offense, man. I, I, Ertz is a beast. I know that. He's probably the best pure receiver on the team. But now they add Deshaun Jackson. You know, they add J.J. Arcega Whiteside as a red zone weapon. They add Miles Sanders out of the backfield. And it becomes a team that has a lot of targets there, a lot of guys that can be targeted there. And uh, and, and Dallas Goddard's going to, you know, probably get a higher snap percentage going into his second year. They're going to run a lot of two tight end sets. So Ertz, yeah, while he's a beast, I also think there's probably not a lot of room for him to grow anywhere in terms of statistically. So um, I, I'm liking OJ Howard, you know, three rounds later than grabbing one of those guys in the second round and, you know, stack up one of those um, top top uh top guys so all right so let's talk about some of these guys like Jalen Richard what a fucking pick by Jalen Richard oh that was me sick so uh one thing I like for instance like uh Ryan Fitzpatrick right that's a guy that kind of falls into the mold where I'm talking about like Josh Rosen is there they need to see what they have in Josh Rosen so at some point or another Ryan Fitzpatrick is going to be on the bench this year right the chances of him being the full-time starter for 16 full games is almost zero. So in my opinion, that's a horrible best ball pick because, listen, you're only going to draft two quarterbacks, maybe three quarterbacks. So you don't need guys who are sitting out games. You don't need guys who are going to be zeros for you because you're already going to have injuries. You're already going to have bye weeks. So what happens if you draft two quarterbacks? One of them is Ryan Fitzpatrick. Your other, quarterbacks get, your other quarterback gets hurt, right? Or your other quarterback's on a bye. You are getting zero points in your lineup for that week. And at the quarterback position, that's huge. That's that's 20 points each week, right? So you're basically, if, if you draft two quarterbacks, Ryan Fitzpatrick is your second quarterback, ends up getting benched week eight. Your other quarterback gets hurt. You literally just lost that best ball league. Any money that you put into that best ball league is gone. It's fucking down the shitter. So that's what I mean by drafting guys who might not make the roster, might not make an impact, right? Um... For instance, like Ricky Seals-Jones. I like Ricky Seals-Jones, but there's a good chance that maybe he just falls behind Charles Clay. Maybe he doesn't play this year because they already have four wide receivers that they want to get on the field at all times. So it gets a little tricky when you're doing that stuff. Um, tight ends, yeah, I understand that there is definitely like a risk reward, especially with these later tight ends. It's really tough to predict. I kind of like Gerald Everett. I feel like he's someone who, um, who might take it. I know every year it feels like there's Gerald Everett love and Gerald Everett breakout articles, but... Um, the guy's been getting more and more involved with the Rams offense. He just turned 25 years old. There is a very long learning curve, of course. He was a second round pick, 462 40 yard dash. That is very, very, very fast. And, um, you know, I, I want to look at his snap percentages first off. Actually, you know what? We'll use the Big Dog Draft Guide uh, receiving charts. Uh, 
Uh, speaking of Devin Singletary before, too, I, I remember I mentioned him as, as a guy I like later. There was reports that he was running with the ones, him and Frank Gore running with the ones. I believe TJ, TJ Eldon's been out with a hamstring, and I'm not really sure why Shady's not running with the ones, but maybe they just like Devin Singletary more than Shady at this point in his career. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but interesting to note nonetheless. If Singletary can take over that one role, I'm a big fan. All right, so we saw him play the full 16, um, doubled his catch total, but wasn't very efficient on those catches. This is... It's not actually a very good leap in, in year two, to be honest with you. So maybe everything I'm saying just sounds dumb, but I want to look more into the snaps and stuff like that. Because he played the 16 games, uh, had a snap share of 35%. That's not the best. Who's the other um, fucking tight end on this team? I forget. I feel like both of them just get hyped up to a crazy amount every year. Gerald Everett. Tyler Higby is the other one. Let's see what Higby was doing in relativity. So he can be played on 72% of the snaps, huh? But he had less targets. So Gerald Everett was like their receiving tight end. And it is his third year, guys. So I kind of like the fact that, you know, he is going to catch 35 passes again this year. Um, so at least, like, compared to these other guys where Eifert has the injury history, of course, we have no idea if Matt Lacoste is going to play or if he's even going to be the starter for New England. Jason Witten, we have no idea if he's going to be used outside of the red zone. Ian Thomas is coming into the year with a leg injury. Cameron Brait. Cameron Brait's not a bad late round pick either because he's going to be on the field. We know that. And he's going to be involved in the red zone. But the rest of these guys, like, all, in their range of outcomes is literally not playing on more than 5% of the snaps. So even a guy like Gerald Everett, who is going to, you know, coming into his third year, play on at least like 35, 40% of the snaps and get 40 targets or something is better than having a zero in your lineup. So that that's the kind of things you need to be thinking about when you're in the later rounds of drafts. Now we are in the 17th round. Um, and I will be going with seven wide receivers eventually um uh my clock's gonna time out huh shit Duh. they took fucking cj anderson for me that will be the only share of cj anderson i have i'm sorry i get caught up in you know doing these other tool things and talking to you guys um so I, I don't necessarily pay attention to all my drafts but it's 17th round so we have seven running backs that actually might be the first time i've ever taken seven running backs in a draft Let's look at the squad we have thus far. We have Andrew Luck and Dak Prescott as the quarterbacks. I love that. And the reason I went so heavy on running backs was because I started off with Melvin, Melvin Gordon and Todd Gurley. And you know I don't like Todd Gurley, but the fact that I use high draft capital on him. Melvin Gordon, Todd Gurley, uh, Peyton Barber, Devin Singletary, Jalen Richard, CJ Anderson at running back. Wide receivers are Mike Evans, Tyler Lockett, Will Fuller, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, Deshaun Jackson, Devin Funches. Now, this is where, like, this is why I like going with running backs early in, in these drafts because I see so much value from rounds, like, 8 through eight through 12 in these kind of wide receivers. Like, I think I'm going to get really, even if, like, one of these guys busts, or even two of two of these guys busts, Mark MVS, Deshaun Jackson, Devin Funches, one of them hits how I think it's going to hit. Like, you're going to have a nice wide receiver three, wide receiver two in your lineup on a consistent basis. Um, so if you grab a couple early wide receivers like Mike Evans, Tyler Lockett, and then pair them with a few of these high upside mid-round, late-round picks, I think you're going to be good at wide receivers. So I do like going with the running backs early on. Um, and then we grabbed O.J. Howard, Gerald Everett. I might grab a third tight end here instead of uh, another wide receiver because Gerald Everett is my third tight end. Now, normally I'll go with two quarterbacks and two tight ends and... Um, And then I'll use the rest on running backs and wide receivers. But if I realize one of those positions is really weak, it's not quarterback because I have Luck and Prescott, so I don't need a third quarterback. But if one of those positions is really weak, like my tight end kind of is, and OJ Howard you know, might wear down at the end of the year, I probably need to get a third backup at that position. I planned this draft very poorly. Last week's team came out really well. I'm not liking how this te this week's team came out. Let's talk about why I don't like it. One, I probably could have went with another wide receiver over Todd Gurley there, like uh, a T.Y. Hilton or, you know, Stephon Diggs, Brandon Cooks in the third round, and then use more like high upside running back picks in these mid rounds. Like I could have went with T.Y. Hilton here, so I would have had T.Y. and Mike Evans, and then instead of, you know, Tyler Lockett, Will Fuller, I could have went with, um, I don't know, David Montgomery, 
and Rashad Penny or something like that. So, the, you know, these this is why these mock drafts are so good for preparing because you get a feel for like when you need to start targeting guys and how you feel about your team when you take, let's say, a tight end early or if you leave the first two rounds with um, a running back or if you leave the first three rounds with a wide receiver. You know, you get a feel for like, okay, if I go wide receiver, wide receiver, tight end, you know, who realistically is going to be my running back one? And it's such good practice for when you're leading up to your draft. So again, draft.com, the draft app, add me at Nick Colano, use promo code BDGE when you sign up, hit that thumbs up button if you don't hate this video so far. I hope you guys are having a good uh, 4th of July weekend. Is anyone doing anything good? I have like no good plans other than my best friend Steve's going to be crashing on my fucking couch this weekend. Like, I have no say in it. He's just like, I'm driving to your apartment and I'm crashing on your couch. His girlfriend is fucking uh, going out to California this week to visit her friend out there. And she texts Steve and goes, um, you know what? I feel like having a seventh wide receiver is more important than a third tight end. So I'm going to go with the wide receiver here. Who do we like here? Do we like anyone? Ooh, see, this gets ugly as shit down here. Because I don't have faith in like any of these guys actually playing. I kind of don't hate Ted Ginn. As much as we all like Traquan Smith, like, Ted Ginn was still very involved last year. And there's no reason not to think that he's still going to be involved this year. Um, like, even when he came back down the stretch, like his playoff games, right? He, he, he was hurt most of the year, but he came back for Week 16, Divisional Playoffs, Conference Championship. Eight, seven, six targets, 74 yards, 44 yards, 58 yards, like... That, if that's something that you can consistently get into your lineup in the 18th round is literally the last pick in best ball, I will live with that. I just, like, make excuses for every player I take on the roster. Like, had I not taken him, I would have been like, Ted Ginn's a horrible pick, you know? And then I take him and just start fucking talking nonsense. It's the way she goes. I finessed the big facts. Um, wow. <laughs> Frank Gore, huh? Respect, baby. Yeah, so Steve's girlfriend texts him. He's like, yo, we're going to, uh, we got invited to a party on a boat. The theme of the party is thoughts and yachts. I was like, one, that sucks that your girlfriend is going to that party, too. It's a phenomenal fucking name, though. I love theme parties. There's, like, nothing more I like than a theme party. And that's a good one. But that's, like, for, like, you got to be a real rich white folk. Like, who the fuck just has a yacht to have a party on? So if you got a yacht, I just gave you a phenomenal party tool or party theme. And Steve was like, literally don't tell me the re any of the rest of your itinerary after she told him that. I'd be so mad if my girlfriend went to a Yachts and Thoughts party. Just to tell you what, she ain't a yacht, so by default, you know what she is. Anyways, 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 uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, you probably didn't at this point because I just fucking ramble all day like an asshole. But... Um, if you did, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. Make sure you head over to draft.com. Follow them on Twitter. I believe they are at PlayDraft. All this will be linked down below. Use the promo code BDGE when you sign up. Make sure you cop that draft guide because I'm telling you, it's the only thing you need for your 2019 fantasy football draft. People are loving it. You can go read some comments, reviews, testimonials on my Twitter, on my YouTube, whatever, whatever, whatever. This is the final team. I'll give you a second to look at it and make fun of me because it was definitely not one of my best efforts. But you never know. That's why these best ball drafts are really fun because you could do them for a dollar. Do a hundred drafts, you'll probably end up winning a handful of them that you thought you had no clue in winning. But oh, one other thing too, we talked about how stacking gives you a higher percentage win rate, so I make sure I do that in in almost every one of my drafts, and I stack Andrew Luck with Devin Funches, quarterback, wide receiver, or quarterback, running back is fine, or quarterback, tight end, any of the following don't matter. But that's it. I'll see y'all on. Uh, we're not live streaming tomorrow. I'll see you on Monday. I'm not even sure what that video is going to be, but I think it's going to be mid-round running backs, like how I did mid-round wide receivers with Calvin Ridley, Mike Williams versus DJ Moore last week. I think we're going to do something like that for running backs. Either way, I love you. Happy 4th. Goodbye.